We have another top speaker coming up on this stage. Before I reveal her, let's have a look who she is. Can we please have the video? Jana Mesca. Yeah, I'd like to welcome Johanna Maske. She is the CEO of Global Situation Room and the ex-head of White House Press Advance for Barack Obama. Now, Global Situation Room is a public affairs firm with offices in Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles. And, um, yes, welcome. And uh, Johanna's actually served President Ob Barack Obama for more than eight years, and she's played a really critical role in two successful presidential campaigns. And now, since leaving the White House in 2015, she's been active in working with media companies and technology firms and applying herself and her wonderful skills across sectors. So, welcome, Johanna. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. For eight years to 42 countries and to almost every state within the United States of America, I had the privilege of traveling with President Barack Obama. I think I've got slides. Yes, I do. Um, for those eight years, over and over and over, I saw him write Dream Big Dreams, and that's exactly what we did. Um, I like to flash back, though, because before his dream was a reality, there were a lot of people who said to us, um, good luck with that. Barack Hussein Obama, ha, 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 uh, he's not going to be the next president of the United States. In fact, they would say, you're never going to work in politics again if you decide to do this, or you know, you're wasting your time. Um, I, I find that after you're successful, all those same people say, oh, I always knew you were going to be a success. You know, you, you were always going to do, you know, great things, and of course President Obama was elected. It was always meant to be. But it didn't feel meant to be at that point in Iowa. So I started at the very beginning of the Iowa caucuses back in 2007, um, and Iowans were pretty skeptical. In fact, there were many times when we couldn't get 25 people in a room to hear him. There were times where we were struggling to fill a room for Michelle Obama, uh, the first lady who now draws massive crowds. How do you go from that beginning stage to that place where you have the oxygen and the ability to really transcend? It's been my pleasure to be here with Block Show. I've listened to many of you today, and I've been thinking um, the causes that you're talking about, human rights, transparency, um, bringing about a better global economy, one that's inclusive, optimistic, um, one that's entrepreneurial. Those were the reasons that I was drawn to President Obama. He talked in 2004 about my little hometown, Galesburg, Illinois, and the workers there that had lost their jobs because of changes in the economy. He talked about the desire for the future of America and what we could do together to unite behind that. In listening to a lot of you today, I've heard many of those same sentiments. Um, everyone said at the time, you know, we were the most digitally savvy campaign, and that's... Uh, uh, to me, a little humorous when I look back on it and you think of our giant blackberries and our, um, all of the things that we did to try to stay uh, innovative. But that, I would argue, is not how we won. I would argue the way we won was actually in our engagement strategy. So we started at the very beginning of Iowa, and you all kind of look at your own strategies and you figure out how can you grow. Um, Iowa is a pretty affordable place in the United States to grow. So what we did is we put offices all across the uh, state of Iowa. We had physical offices with people engaged in telling President Obama's stories. We went to the high schools. Our teams started this program called Barack Stars. When no one else would listen, we recruited high school students who couldn't even vote. We got those high school students together to learn about our democracy and what we needed to do if we wanted to be involved. Um, 
President Obama engaged those students, brought them into the process. They got their parents involved, and ultimately, we won the Iowa caucuses. Um, the, the victory in Iowa uh, was only to be um, completed with a loss in New Hampshire. With ups come downs, and you learn a lot along the way. Um, when I look back at our time on the campaigns, it was probably the best of what we did. Our motto was respect, empower, include. I believe wholeheartedly that that was crucial to our victories, that it was crucial that we brought it back in South Carolina, and that's how we won South Carolina, that's how we went on to election night, and that's how we won to travel around the world. Um, you know, the, the world and the geopolitics of the world can be a little daunting. And right now, a lot of people ask me when I travel around, what, what should we do? Um, when we feel at loss with our political leaders and we feel like they're not representing our voices, what can we do? And I often recall when President Obama would struggle to pass things that he thought would bring about that more optimistic, inclusive economy. We would say, oh, we need to go rally our base. And we'd go out to a state in the United States and try to rally them up and say, okay, get engaged. And they'd be like, oh, no, you've got it. You're the president. The truth is it's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us around the world working towards that optimistic, inclusive, innovative economy if we want to create it. So I have to say, you know, of all of the incredible things I got to do, traveling the world was one of the privileges of uh, being in the position I was in for President Obama. I got to see the best of historic sites. I got to see incredible people around the world who are hungry for that opportunity. And I truly, again, believe that this is still possible and it's still within our reach. President Obama gave me, gave many, the hope that we could change. But he wasn't the one who could change it all for us. It's going to take each and every one of us. As privileged as I was to travel with President Obama to, um, into Buckingham Palace in marine helicopters, to uh, see Nelson Mandela's prison cell and the struggle for equality in South Africa, to see um, Petra in, in Jordan and all of the remarkable sights, to see the hope and enthusiasm of people in India building new technologies, the coolest thing I ever did was have my child. I believe truly that women birth the future, that women have to be engaged in the technological revolution, in the changes that are going to take us from here to there. And I believe that if we look at what we want to create for our children every day, and we dream those big dreams together, it's still within our reach. I know I've got time for questions. I, I will leave it uh, for a few questions and then wrap up with a little story of Yes, We Can. Um, questions from the audience? Questions? Ha. Hello, thank you. I, I would like to ask uh, about the beginning what you uh, said about Iowa. As me is revealing, it's not a little bit unclear. Why is Iowa is always so important in American elections? Um, like the primaries in Iowa and the results in Iowa, so it's uh, very like high news. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's actually really important. Um, so Iowa plays a pivotal role in the election process because it's the first place in the United States to vote. And in the United States, the election process is designed by the parties. So you have the Democratic Party has one process with a different number of delegates, and the Republican Party has a different process with a different number of delegates. And so Iowa has traditionally had the caucuses. Um, this is a pretty complex voting process. It's not just one vote, one person. You get together in your community, and uh, if you've covered a caucus or ever watched the caucus, there's um, a mathematical equation that they do to discover viability of a candidate. And if a candidate meets viability, that means they go on. So, like I was saying, for an early stage company, you look at the game that is set up not the, 
the game you want to play, but what setup. And so we knew in Iowa we had to meet certain thresholds in certain communities to be able to go on. And that's not just a one vote, one person scenario. So Iowa, um, I will say, you know, a lot of people from other states will say, why Iowa? And even when I lived in Kansas, I was like, why Iowa? When you work in Iowa, you do find out that um, because these voters have always had the privilege of vetting candidates early, they have a, a fantastic respect for the responsibility that they have. And they have traditionally not followed the whim of um, popularity or uh, someone's a celebrity. They'll ask them to come into their home to talk about their ideas moving forward. Now, like I mentioned before, the Democratic process is actually different than the Republican process. And so the Republican process is um, a slightly different one with a different number of superdelegates. It's a pretty complex um, voting process, as everyone knows. Um, but our strategy was if we can come in third in Iowa, we'll be able to go on. And um, not only did we come in third, but with our strategy, we were able to come in first and go on to victory. Other questions? We've got one right here, one right here. Hello. I have a question. Um, when you look at how much you put in, in the system to get Obama elected and to look at how much they did or, or did not put in um, to get Trump um, elected, what do you think on that topic and how does it make you feel? Yeah, I think America is better than President Trump. I think President Trump is um, an outpost or a sign of dissatisfaction with inaction in America. I often say I'm not part of the resistance because we had a resistance for six years. President Obama, it was uh, two terms, we, or two years, we had a Democrats um, in the House and Senate, and then the Republicans took over. And I w remember being involved with one of the meetings where we tried to um, open up a Republican caucus meeting to the press so that we could have cameras there because he was saying, if you guys make me the enemy, you're not going to be able to work with me on anything. And indeed, that's what they did. For six years, they did very little to work with the president. I would argue that that, that inaction led to frustration with current politics, and people said, I just want anything else. And instead of getting involved themselves and saying, I want to be at the table, they gave up. In, and in many cases, thought maybe if they vote for someone else, he'll be able to fix it. Um, I think it's a false bill of goods. If you look at the United States right now and you look at the things we need for our future, it's immigration, entrepreneurship, and exports. We need to play more globally, and those are some of the very things I would argue President Trump is attacking. So um, is it frustrating for those of us who were involved in the Obama era? Absolutely, it's frustrating, but I would say, to the point earlier where he managed to do something that we haven't been able to do, which is energize people to believe in being part of their own future, um, I think that's a good positive outgrowth. And I do believe that in the end, it is still like President Obama said at the going away speech, which is two steps forward, one step back. And it's a pretty long step back, in my opinion, right now, uh, on what we're doing. Um, certainly, we needed tax reform. We probably didn't need tax reform in the current way. Certainly, you know, every country needs to look at innovation. I don't know that they're giving the most innovative people the place at the table, but rather people who pay uh, for that privilege. And so it's frustrating, but I do believe that it's... Um, in the end, going to involve more people coming to the table, and that's a good thing. More questions? Um, yes. Like when we see the case of uh, President Obama, ex-President Obama, uh, we see a person that uh, it's like it fits 
in the kind of leader like you need to create a movement because he has kind of a, a special skill to connect with people. Then my question is, what to do when the leader of a movement don't have such a remarkable skill? Like how you, how you approach that situation? Like if you are in, try, trying to create a movement out on blockchain, but the CEO or the founder don't have that kind of charm, what to do? That's a really good question. And in fact, the majority of people never met President Obama. So um, all they know from him is representatives and then uh, images, right? You create that image that goes around. I do think it's a particular uh, precarious situation depending on the CEO's uh, ego. Um, I was really lucky to work for a um, pretty predictable principle. And um, to that extent, with your CEO, you can, um, you know, you know where your CEO would fall on that predictability level. We could coach him, and um, our team did. In fact, if you look back at the beginning, he was one who was always willing to learn. So. At the beginning of the Iowa caucuses, there was a mistake. He made a mistake. He got on the phone with us all and he said, I'm not going to be perfect. I'm human. I'm going to make mistakes. So are all of you. We need to move forward. Um, I would argue that for a company, a company can be more than just your CEO. And when you start telling a message, that's actually more important than that figurehead. So if we flash back, the, the energy for President Obama didn't come because he was speaking and talking about his view. When I saw it change in Iowa was when he started telling a story about a little lady in a church hat in a meeting he went to in South Carolina when uh, he didn't want to go, it was raining, it was a nasty day, there were maybe you know, 10 people when he got there, and he didn't want to be there. And he said he got there, and there was this little lady in the back, and she starts saying, fired up, ready to go, fired up, ready to go. And he said, you know, at first I was looking at her and I'm saying, I'm being upstaged, I'm the candidate, I'm the, pres the candidate for the President of the United States, and you know, this little lady's upstaging me. And then he said, and pretty soon I started feeling kind of fired up, and I started feeling kind of ready to go. And that uh, ability um, to change one room, the voice to change one room, he would argue would mean that one voice could change a state, one voice could change a nation, and one voice could change a world. It was that story when people started getting off of their chairs and cheering for him. It was that story that brought out the momentum that we needed in each state by state, and that story that we continued to tell digitally that motivated and fueled people to rally around the cause. So I understand the predictum predicament when you don't have the most charming um, spokesperson, but I would say it can be more than your spokesperson and that your story and telling your story and connecting with people that way is going to be as important. I think we have time for one last question. I think we've got Hill. Hi. Hi. Um, how much of what you have learned and uh, done in the White House uh, can you use now in your current job and how do you move forward? Yeah, thank you. You learn so much in the White House. I'm going to speak tomorrow on a panel about government regulation and I found it really interesting, the previous panel, because I do have a lot of opinions there. But, um, you know, I said the, the biggest thing I learned in being in the White House is not only the pace, that you have to deal with, you're really drinking from the fire hose, and there's a reason why m many administrations early on are uh, reactionary, because the pace is just um, nonstop. Every day, you're bombarded with more and more problems, and you have to solve them. Um, over the course of time, you know, I would argue that you get better at figuring out what is the most important thing that you need to prioritize, and you look at it a lot different, more differently in looking at, you know, what's the real goal, what's the real um, uh, achievement that we're trying to get, and cut through that. 
I think not only is there uh, skills that you learn in the White House, you also uh, learn a lot um, about different entities and how they work. Our firm now, Global Situation Room, works on global good, global trade, and global risk. Um, we believe firmly that uh, global trade is crucial to the future of the economy, and that we need to have those conversations with entrepreneurs about creating companies at the start globally. Um, I, I do believe that there is a number of skills that are transferable, and not only that, but uh, our former U.S. ambassadors work with companies on different uh, scaling projects. Um, I think I have one minute left, so I just want to tell the story of, um, you know, at times it's extraordinarily frustrating when you're building things, and you just want to give up. I mean, I had worked so hard to get on that campaign. I literally uh, harassed the state director. So I was living down the hall from him, and I, um, I would harass him every day because I wanted to work on that campaign. I said, I'm going to work for Barack Obama. He, didn't even, he hadn't announced. He was in Hawaii. You work so hard to get on it, and then you face challenge after challenge, and you want to give up. And I have to say, it's only because I didn't give up and didn't give up and didn't give up and didn't give up that I got to experience this incredible uh, moment that I got to um, have my son, that I got to see firsthand that change. And I have to tell you all, I want you to believe, yes, we can, yes, we can, yes, we will. Thank you very much.